So first, before we get started, thank you so much, uh, not only to Jared, but to Felicia as well for all of your assistance. And thank you to all that are here tonight and that may watch the recording. I really do appreciate it. Really appreciate your time. And this is to be the first of hopefully a quarterly recurring finance webinar in which we, we touch on a, a variety of topics. And the idea is to do one more broad based, which is what we're going to do tonight. And then every other month, do something a little bit more targeted, perhaps on cryptocurrency. So that's a little teaser into uh, to what's perhaps to come. But tonight, uh, as Jared alluded to, this is going to focus on financial literacy in today's world. The idea behind this was uh, we just had Financial Literacy Week a couple of weeks ago. Really excited about that. As Jared mentioned, my background is one of finance, and it's uh, something I'm very uh, passionate and excited about. And I hope what we go through tonight uh, you all can find some applicability uh, in your world. And just kicking right off with it, here we have a slide with a quote from Warren Buffett. Obviously, uh, Warren Buffett is someone that's well known in, in the financial and the accounting community. <clears throat> and he's accredited with saying, do not save what is left after spending, but rather spend what is left after saving. And we're going to elaborate that, elaborate on that in the, in the slides to come and talk about a recurring theme tonight and as we continue to have this on a quarterly basis is intentionality, being very intentional about things. And that's the spirit of what he's getting at here. And this kind of is going to focus us to a, to a central point of what we're going to have tonight. And that's, that's intentionality, being very intentional, very purposeful, and having a plan. Um, that's going to be essential in the whole idea and construct construct of what financial literacy is, being very intentional, having a plan, and then sticking to the plan. And along those lines, we've got three things that we're going to try to focus on tonight. I always try to have an outline of things to focus on to, to keep me focused. Otherwise, I'll, I'll start chasing rabbits and, and go down a bunch of other tangents. So tonight, we're going to focus on, first and foremost, establishing a budget, <laughs> branching off from that a bit, uh, talking about Retirement savings, uh, that's most likely in the months to come, something we'll focus on <clears throat> and have a webinar specifically dedicated to that alone because that's a very big topic that we, we won't have time to unpack all of that tonight, but we're going to touch on some key aspects of that tonight, and hopefully you guys will have some questions. As you have those, I know Jared's tracking that, and I believe we're going to pause and make sure we get to all of those at the end of the presentation. And then lastly, as Jared mentioned, Felicia, uh, she is the guru on all things accounting and taxes. She's going to bring us home tonight on our last few slides and talk about <clears throat> everything that we've discussed tonight, the effect that that has on our taxable liability, because we want to make sure that we take care of that as well. That goes to that idea of being in, very intentional, having a plan, and being very purposeful. So our first topic is budgeting, okay? One of the most difficult things <clears throat> about the whole process of budgeting, without a doubt, is getting started. It's not fun. Uh, even you know someone like myself that um, has you know dedicated a large portion of my life to finance and things in that field. It's uh, it's just not a very fun thing to do. So that's oftentimes the most difficult part of having a budget is sitting down, doing the work, and taking a very realistic look at things. All right. One thing that we've said repeatedly already tonight is we have to be very intentional. We have to have a plan. We have to stick to it. These are all things that go into being a budget. And if the most important thing is being intentional and having a plan, the next most important thing is making it as simple as possible. The best analogy I can provide to this is going on a diet because that's something we've either done ourselves or we have someone that we know has probably done and I know just from my own experience, if, you know, you have this elaborate diet where, <clears throat> you know, it's very difficult to do, you have to look up all these rules and what you can do, what you can't do. It's very difficult. It's very discouraging. And a budget can be the same way. We need to make it as simple as possible. That way, when things get difficult, we can stick to it because we know what we've, what we've set up. And it's very easy to stick to, or at least as easy as possible. So, when we're doing our budget, we need to try to keep it as simple as possible. So whatever media works best for you, whether it's Excel, Microsoft Excel, or some similar word processing software, 
whether it's pen and paper, so whatever it is, whatever is easiest for you, that's what I would suggest. There's no one correct way to set up a budget. There's many ways, and that's what we'll get into a little bit more as we explore this topic a little bit more. So in unpacking the idea of <clears throat> establishing a budget, we've got kind of four main bullet points, if you will. So the first thing that we need to figure out is why are we budgeting? We need to create some goals. Within that, within those goals, I always recommend having short-term, intermediate, and long-term goals. Um, an example of a long-term goal might be saving for retirement or uh, saving enough money for a down payment on a house or something like that. That's something that's certainly not going to happen overnight. Those are very good goals. But if those are the only goals that we have, uh, we need to make some milestones to those because it might take a year or two or perhaps more. Uh, if you're saving for retirement, that's a very long-term goal, uh, perhaps 20, 30, 40 years. So we need to have shorter, more intermediate, and, and you know, maybe our first short-term goal might just be to you know, save $500 in our savings account or $1,000, whatever it is. No amount is too small, no amount is too big. Like I said, everyone is going to be a different, everyone's at different uh, points of their journey in life. So don't get discouraged um, by whatever your goals are. Uh, the most important thing is, like we mentioned a moment ago, in keeping things simple, whatever works best for you, whether it's writing it down on pen and paper, entering it into a spreadsheet, we need to meticulously catalog all, emphasis on all, our income and expenses. So that, that includes Starbucks, that includes Amazon, that includes everything that we do, uh, even though we might not want to admit to ourselves or our spouses or significant others how much we do spend in these places, when we sit down and do a budget, we have to do all of these things. Um, then the very next thing that we need to do is determine if there's anything left over. And at this stage of the game, it's okay if there's not. That's why we're sitting down and doing it. If you sit down and you find out, okay, I'm, I make $2,000 a month after taxes and I'm spending $2,100 a month, we've found a problem. All right, so now we need to start reining it in um, and, and figuring out what can we do without. And that's that last bullet point there, making revisions as needed. Taking it all the way back to our first quote that we had from Warren Buffett, we need to be intentional about saving and allocate money to that first, even if it's a dollar. Now that's a bit of an extreme example, but even if we can only afford to save one dollar, start there and then go from, you know, and then start to pay the necessities, as we see on the slide, the electricity, all of the utilities, the, the mortgage or the rent, whatever it is. Those are obviously things that are going to take priority over going to Target, Walmart, uh, online shopping at Amazon, you know, coffee, or whatever those things are. Allocate for those, but then, like we said, make revisions as needed so that you have the ability to save, but at the same time, spend money on yourself. Along this line, you may have heard this, and there are many variations of this. You don't have to stick to this. This is just merely one example, the 50-20-30 the budget rule. It's very popular. It's gained a lot of traction in recent years. 50% on needs, 30% on wants, 20% on savings. And a lot of people say, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, whittle down that wants to 10%. And I, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good idea to start with, but I would caution people to not be too strict on the wants because you have to be able to do something for yourself. You have to be able to have fun. Otherwise, you're not going to stick to it. You're going to be miserable. And then, you know, we ask ourselves, why am I doing all this? Why am I budgeting? I'm just miserable all the time. I don't ever do anything for myself. Uh, while it is rewarding to see our savings account, our retirement account, all these other things build up, if we never do anything for ourselves, then what's the point? Um, you know, we, we work hard. We, you know, we want to spend our money on the ones that we care about, the ones that we love, and ourselves. And if we, we don't budget for that, we're not going to have any fun and we're simply not going to stick to the budget that we do. Um, obviously, if you need to modify these percentage allocations, obviously do that as you see fit within reason with everything that we just talked about. But this is just a guideline. Uh, like I said, feel free to modify these as you see fit. Um, within those categories, if you find that, you know, you're maybe uh, after looking at your budget, you're spending 40 percent or maybe even more than half on all these wants. And you need to try to get that down into the, the 20 or the 30 percent. Here's some ideas on ways that you can do that. Finding ways to cut spending, uh, subscriptions, memberships that you don't use, especially those 
Um, if you have smart devices, either you know your Android or your um, iPhones, where they have these automatically recurring and renewing memberships that you probably may not even remember that you had, or maybe you've got Hulu or Netflix and you can't remember the last time you watched them, go in there and cancel those. Um, committing to eating out only once a month, you can uh, substitute that with whatever you'd like. Um, you know, however, if you like, you know, coffee, whether it's Starbucks or a similar coffee shop or online shopping at Amazon or anywhere else, um, looking for deals, uh, looking for coupons. If you have children, looking for places, I myself, I have six daughters, fun fact, uh, looking for places where kids eat free because that can be a huge saver. Um, I, I know my wife and I do that quite a bit. So, um, these are all ideas and ways that, uh, creative ways, and there's many more than these. These are just a few uh, ways to cut spending. Another one, um, if, you know, you're out walking around or, you know, scrolling social media and we see one of these ads for something, they know what we want to buy. Giving ourselves a cooling off period and waiting a few days, especially if it's a large purchase. Or maybe implement that into our budget. If it's a short term or intermediate goal where you're going to say, I'm going to save up for this, and then you rework your budget. And it's very rewarding uh, to set these goals for ourselves, to achieve them, and then you feel you know, a sense of accomplishment, as you should, because you planned for it, you set aside the money for it on a monthly basis, and, and you achieved it. And these are, these are all, once, it's, it's kind of like a snowball effect. Once you start small, it, it yields bigger and more rewarding and bigger goals, and it can be a very rewarding um, process to endeavor to, to go into. <laughs> Just defining a little bit our short term, what a short term or what a, um, that should say long term. So my apologies there. That's my bad. Um, short term or long term goal. It's somewhat self explanatory, but, uh, we're going to, for the sake of this, uh, presentation, we're going to define a short term goal as that is between one and three years and a long term goal is, you know, four years or more, perhaps. Short term goals. We've talked about them. An emergency fund. Those of you may be familiar with Dave Ramsey. Uh, one of the things that he always recommends to his followers and students is building up first this emergency fund. And I, and I personally think that's a great idea. Uh, what should your emergency fund be? It depends on what your situation currently looks like. On average, uh, the recommendation is three to nine months of living expenses just in case. You know, if um, the pandemic has taught us many things, um, Chief among those is being prepared for the unexpected. So having a savings of three to nine months of expenses can be a, a, a big benefit um, if something you know comes out of left field in life. Um, vacation, down payments for cars, insert any large payment or expense that uh, you know that uh, whatever it is that you might want to splurge and spend money on, feel free to in, uh, insert that into that category. The long-term goals, which we'll transition to here in just a moment, retirement, uh, your or your child's education, down payment on a home. These are all things that can uh, constitute a, a long-term goal. And in my opinion, it's important to have both. That way you're constantly working multiple goals and you, you build, build all of these into your budget. <laughs> all right, now that we've, assuming we've done all of that, we have our budget in place, we have our goals in place, now to get back to reality a little bit and talk about how difficult it's going to be, especially in the first couple of months, all right? Um, especially if we have been operating without a budget, it's going to be very difficult if we've now set guidelines for ourselves and say, okay, we are only going to spend $20 a month at Starbucks this month. You know, after the first week or so, you may have, you know, blown up your Starbucks allocation and now you have to wait until the end of the month. It's going to be very difficult to abide by the rules. Uh, just in social science and looking at people and how we behave as humans, on average, it takes a person 66 days. So it's about, like we said, one to two months for a new behavior to become automatic and for it to become a habit. With that, don't be too hard on yourself. If you make a mistake or if you, you, ac you know, you accidentally spend a little bit more, but you've, you know, you've brought it back in from where it was and you're making steady improvement, you know, forgive yourself, learn from that mistake, move on. Um, the important thing that I always tell my kids is, you know, it's everyone's going to make mistakes. It's 
did we learn a lesson from the mistake and are we trying to not make the same mistake again? So just giving yourself that grace and allowing yourself to not be too hard on yourself because oftentimes we can be our own worst enemy in that regard and uh, end up just throwing our hands up and giving up. Stick to the plan, stay with it. After the first month or two, I think you'll find it'll be much, much easier. <laughs> All right, retirement planning. This is one of those long-term goals and as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this is something that I would like to spend a lot more time on as a webinar entirely by itself uh, because there's a lot of different areas that we could go into and we could talk for an hour or more. We won't tonight, but we could. And so we'll try to just hit the high points here with this tonight. This first one, and I, I have up here start young. If you're not able to do that, don't, don't fret. Uh, you're in good company because I, I did not either. Uh, but it's never too late to get started. But if you are young and you do have the ability to start now, start now. Uh, there's huge opportunities out there if the earlier you start. Now, that does not mean that you cannot make up for lost time and you can still be on a path to success and a happy, successful retirement. But start as young as you can. Um, uh, along those lines, the the idea there, if if you have a, for example, a 22 year old, that that's you know, if we go further back than that, you know, to 19, 20, 21, the numbers go up even more exponentially. But on average, if you have a 22 year old individual who started putting, say, 10 percent of their earnings in a employee employer sponsored 401k plan, we'll talk a minute about what that is here in just a moment for those that may not know. If they just put 10% of their earnings for their entire life until from they were 22 to when they were 65, using market norms and what the average return of the market is, just by putting 10% away from the age of 22 on an average salary of $40,000 for about 40 years, they'd have $1.7 million saved up for retirement at age 65. All right. Um, by contrast, if you wait in just 10 years and start at 32 with the same contributions, that only nets 780,000. Now, only 780,000, what a great problem to have, right? But um, you just that, that just illustrates the, pro, the, uh, the ability of compound interest, which I'm sure you've probably heard of before, and the advantages of starting young. If, you know, moving on to our next one, if you have an employer sponsored 401k, um, we'll just keep things at the very high level tonight and not dig deep into that. That's basically an employee an employer sponsored retirement plan. A lot of them will match your contributions up to a certain percentage. So if you contribute 5%, your employer will match that. Um, without getting too deep into the rabbit hole with that tonight, if that's an option, please do it. That's free money that you are not taking advantage of Find a way to make that fit into your budget if you're not doing it. That that should be number one priority right there. Call your HR person tomorrow after you've done your budget and see if you can figure out a way to, to factor that in. That's a 401k. That's a type of retirement plan. Another type of retirement plan is an IRA, an individual retirement account. There's multiple types. Uh, I sometimes say flavors of IRAs out there. Uh, the, the two most common ones are traditional and Roth. Um, during the next uh, few webinars, when we have one that focuses on retirement savings, we'll unpack the advantages and disadvantages of each. But if you have the ability to have both a 401k and an IRA at the same time, hey, more power to you and great that you're just maximizing your retirement savings. Um, if you have the 401k, my recommendation is if you have an employer match, I would go with that first. That's just a personal recommendation. Um, the biggest thing, regardless of what type of retirement account that you have, do not resist the urge to cash these out early. The reason for that is there's penalties that go along with that. Uh, in addition to that, there's taxes in addition to those penalties. So you're really, um, ex excuse the expression, shooting yourself in the foot a little bit, so to speak. So by, by doing that and you're, you know, you're, you're kind of, hindering your retirement savings and uh, the ability of your money to work for you. So um, obviously life happens, emergencies happen. If we have saved up and we have those emergency savings, we can avoid having to do this. But 
that being said, if something happens, obviously, you know, emergencies happen, but don't have that as your, your number one go-to contingency plan. That should be a, a last resort type deal. So try to avoid cashing those out um, early if possible. All right, with that, I'm going to pause and transition it to my colleague, Felicia, uh, to take us home with the tax implications of this. We've talked about a lot of different things from budgeting to savings to all sorts of different things. And she's going to spend a little bit of time talking to us about some of the things that we need to be worried about, sometimes what I refer to as behind the scenes, even though they're really not behind the scenes because they're right there in front of us and they're just as, if not more important than the savings themselves. So with that, Felicia, go ahead and take it away. Hi, thank you, Kenny, and thank you, everyone, for uh, attending tonight's uh, webinar. I'm going to be talking to us about tax implication of everything Kenny has talked about. Uh, if you recall, he talked to us about uh, savings and um, uh, savings, investment, then retirement. But I'm going to focus on all of them, uh, the education. He talks about education, retirement, investment, and all of them. So I want to start from behind, which is from the retirement, which is the last thing he talked about. Um, there are two types of retirement account, and uh, Kenny kind of mentioned them, uh, but I'm going to expand a little bit on them. There is something called before tax or tax deferred. Uh, these are uh, money that you can put away before tax. For most people, it's kind of beneficial because that means your adjusted gross income, which is part of what is being taxed for you, the taxable income will now be, uh, will now be reduced. So if you want to, for example, if you, if you are a high income earner right now, then your best bet is to make sure you put as much money away pre-tax to reduce your taxes. So that's number one. So that's what we call before tax or tax deferred. These are your 401ks, your 403bs, your 457B, as well as traditional IRAs. Kenny kind of mentioned that when he was talking. So uh, the contribution, when you contribute now, is going to be pre-tax. That means you're not paying any taxes on that money you're putting away. However, when you withdraw the money later, so maybe when you're 65, 70 years old, when you start getting the money out, that money will be taxed as ordinary income. So you, you might want to talk to a financial planner or your banker to make sure, you know, depending on how much money you make later on, uh, then it might be beneficial for you to put as much away now. Especially if you know that you're making so much money now and you plan to retire and you don't plan to work anymore, then it's a no brainer that you put, the, I mean, put money away in a before tax or tax deferred uh, account. And like Kenny said, it's kind of like free money, especially the 401ks, because most employers match that. So all those money that is being put away on your behalf, as well as that you're putting away as your contribution will be uh, tax free for now until you withdraw it. So the next one I want to talk about is the after-tax Roth uh, IRAs. Uh, these are retirement accounts uh, for tax purposes that, so let's say you make $5,000 a month. Uh, if it's after-tax, out of that $5,000 that you take home, you can now say, okay, I want to contribute $500 or $200, whatever the case may be, after taxes has been taken out. Uh, the advantage of this one is that your money will grow tax-free, if you will. So what that means is that when the time comes for you to get the money out, you're not going to be taxed on it, especially if you wait at least five years before you take the money out. And also, if you make, if you make the, the, the withdrawal because of if there's a death, if the person that owns it dies, or if there's a permanent disability, or once you are 59 and a half or older. So as long as the money has been saved for at least five years, and if you meet any of the other qualification, death, disability, obviously we don't want it to be death, but it happens, or if there's a disability, or once you are 59 and a half. 
the money that you get out with the interest that you earn will be uh, tax free. So that's that's kind of very attractive for a lot of people, especially if you already put away pre-tax. Then the next thing you should do is put away uh, after tax because. Um, you will not be taxed on whatever, all the earnings that you make uh, when you get the money out. So again, like I said, everybody's situation is different. So we're not giving you any tax uh, planning advice or financial planning advice, but we're just giving you information. So everybody's different. So depending on uh, your status now, how much money you're making now, and how much projected money you plan to make in the future will determine whether to do either or both of them. So a lot of people do both. So it might be a good thing for you to explore. Something else I want to talk about is uh, education. So if you put money away for education, so if you know your children or your nieces, your relatives or your nephews, whoever the case may be, uh, if you can put money away for them now, uh, and um, it's always a good idea, especially if you just have a baby. Uh, it's always good to save. It's always easier to save little by little than to wait till, you know, uh, to, to want to say, okay, I'm going to be putting away $1,000. It's so much easier to put away $50, $100 a month over the life of, you know, until the child reaches 18 years old, than to do that now. So we're going to be talking more about that later, but I just want to let you know the tax uh, implication of that is that if it's, if it's used for education, for example, 529, that one is very popular. There are more, and we're going to be talking about that later in the future webinar. I just want to let you know that as long as it is meant for education, and you withdraw it for education, then it's gonna be tax free, okay? And when we talk about education, it could also be for uh, housing, for food, as long as you can show justification for school, it's gonna be tax free, okay? And the last thing I wanna talk about regarding tax implication are your investment. This is where a lot of people put their, you know, they, they, they put their money. Please don't look at what is happening today uh, in the uh, stock market. It, it was really horrible today. So don't look at that and do not let that make you say, I do not want to invest. Like um, Kenny said, if you look at it over the long term, then the short term losses does not really matter because your goal is to put the money put the money away for a long time and don't even look at it. Because if you look at it over the long term, then you, you'll be able to get as much interest as you should. So now talking about investment, um, you can, if you invest, you can get interest depending on what kind of, for example, if you put your money in a savings account, okay? Um, you get interest, you earn interest. Uh, then you also, if you buy stock, there are a lot of stock that they pay you dividend either quarterly or every six months or yearly, regardless of what it is. Um, so all these things, interest, dividend, and all those things that you earn on your investment, they are capital gains. So what that means is that you're not taxed as ordinary income, okay? You are taxed as capital gains. So it has a more favorable tax. Okay. For example, if you, if you are at the highest tax bracket right now, uh, based on the current tax law, uh, if you're getting taxed like 39%, guess what? For capital, gain, for capital gains, it's only 20%. Most people, their capital gains tax is like 10%. Some people don't even pay any capital gain, depending on their income. So take advantage of that. Uh, and uh, get as much, like right now, because of the higher interest rates, uh, interest rates is actually going higher than we did we saw last year because everything depends on what the interest rate looks like. So right now, a lot of uh, IU uh, savings account, you can earn as much as 3% and know that you're not gonna be taxed as ordinary income, it's gonna be capital gains. So it might be a good time to start investing Thank you so much. And that's all I want to talk about today. Thanks so much, Felicia. 
So that pretty much rounds out the entirety of our program, or our presentation, rather. Um, Jared, I'm going to kick it back over to you. I guess we'll go into the Q&A session. I'll go ahead and uh, turn the screen share off, unless you've got something you need me to pull up. Uh, no. Yeah, you can go ahead and turn the um, screen share off. Okay. So just a couple questions so far, um, and one of them is actually maybe just a, just a quick synopsis of what it is. Can you talk a little bit more about what um, compound interest is and how that specifically plays into your um, note, your note about uh, saving early um, as well into those retirement plans? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. So what compound interest is, is it's the uh, long story short, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on this, but it's the best thing ever. Because what it means is the money that you put in initially, and you put into your retirement account as it earns interest, that interest also earns interest. So it's your money working hard for you. So say, for example, um, you put in $100 and you earn 10%. At the end of the year, that account now has $110 because of interest. The next year, when you earn, if you earned 10% again, you now earn 10% on the $110. So you not only get the what we call the principal, the $100 that you originally put in, you're also now earning interest on the additional balance from the interest that was previously earned. So that's that's an illustration of what compound interest is. And if anyone has any follow-up questions to that, I'd be happy to elaborate additionally. Awesome, thank you. And then um, another question, and I, I threw out Mint, um, but do you know of any um, good budgeting apps that you've either used or that you would recommend to help people kind of get the ball rolling on that. So, I mean, some people may want to use pen and paper, but I think a lot of us any day anymore, <laughs> we're technically turning to our mobile devices. Yes, yes. And I, and Mint, to, to your credit, Jared, that's a great one. Um, there are some others that I've seen uh, It's uh, that are apps that I believe are available on both platforms. One is Capital, but spelled with a Q, Q-A-P-I-T-A-L. Um, another one is Digit just spelled as it normally sounds, D-I-G-I-T. Um, and I will say those are these are all three great apps and great programs. I will caution you, they do cost money. So is now it's a small, it's a it's you know comparatively a small amount, but it just as you're doing your budget, everyone's at different, like I said, stages of their life and your budget might be such that you're okay spending whatever it is, seven to ten dollars a month for these services and what they'll just give you an idea of what they'll do. They all kind of offer similar services. They'll round up um, expenses that you have and automatic help you to automate saving because that's what a lot of us, that's where a lot of consumers are right now. And rightfully so. We want things to, like you said, we want our apps and our devices to make our lives easier. Um, and these and these programs definitely do, but just be advised, uh, typically they come with a monetary cost as well. So as long as that's something that you're okay with, uh, those are three that I've uh, come across that I that I know to be uh, fairly good, safe, and functional. Wonderful. Um, and then switching gears a little bit, uh, there was a question about high yield savings accounts. Um, can you talk just briefly about those and how they work? Yeah. So those uh, Felicia kind of touched on that a little bit. So a high yield savings account is is just that they're going to be a little bit more illiquid. Um, than a regular savings account. And what I mean by that is it might have some stipulations on um, when and how you can access that money. So it might be such that you have to leave it in there for a period of six months to 12 months, perhaps even longer. Um, also, you might have to have that money in, involved in uh, slightly riskier markets. And I an emphasis on slightly, because if it's a high yield savings account, it's going to be comparatively safe, uh, a lot safer than if you had it, say, in like the, the stock market, for example. Um, so I think the risk would be comparatively very low. Um, but it's the, the biggest consideration, I would say, with those high yield savings account is just making sure that you understand the stipulations in which regarding when and how long you can access those funds or how long you lose access to those funds before you can recoup them back to yourself. But they can be a great option in whatever your plan is, whatever your budget is, and setting those short, medium, and long-term goals. So just make sure you read the fine print. Yes, correct. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. 
Um, another investment question, and then um, another one, probably Felicia, I'll kick that one over to you, but um, probably, uh, and maybe both of you can answer this one too, but um, for those that are looking to invest, is there, you know, and I, I caution to say, you know, can you give financial advice, but are there specific ones or uh, types of investments that are really, you know, popular right now, really giving high returns, anything along those lines that you can maybe help the, um, uh, the attendees? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, like you mentioned, I'll, I'll, I'll have to stop short of recommending any particular um, investment vehicle or um, a, a company because we can't give out investment advice. But I, I think I can adequately address the question without wading into that. Um, this, in the spirit of the sense of the question was asked, I think mutual funds would be a really good place to look. Obviously, do your own research, do your own homework. Uh, but what a mutual fund is, is it's a pooling of various investments to achieve an objective. And with that, you have high risk mutual funds. And obviously with that, the potential emphasis on potential return is going to be higher. You have more low risk mutual funds that are in safer uh, investments that might be closer to that high yield savings account projected return. But what they do is they automatically diversify, meaning spread out the risk. Um, easy analogy, not putting all your eggs in one basket. So it's not like buying shares of Apple, Amazon, Facebook. You're buying shares, portions of shares of multiple companies. And now the risk is evenly spread out. That's what a mutual fund is. Um, so I would encourage you to look to those perhaps as a good starting point. Um, and if you're investing in a 401k or something employer sponsored, they will oftentimes have a representative that you can call and they'll get and they are licensed to actually give you financial advice and can tell you and elaborate more specifically on these things. So, uh, Felicia, you, you got anything to add to that? Yes, I do. And thank you for talking about diversification, uh, because that is very important, especially in finance, when we invest, uh, that is always good. Uh, because to diversify our risk, just like what you say, you don't want to put all your head in one basket. And um, for my, I mean, I, I'll say that that's a very good thing to do. So regardless of what you're doing, and you gave very good advice, um, Kenny, that mutual funds are great. I will also say that even if they don't want to do mutual product, in addition to mutual fund, they can just buy uh, maybe stock, do some stocks, do some savings, uh, do, because just like what you said earlier on, you want to put some money for emergency use. Uh, that way, if anything happens, I mean, maybe you lose your job or there's something that happens, you want to have some money saved up for emergency. Then once you have that, then you want to put money in something that will give you more uh, interest because the problem is a lot of people sometimes they're very afraid of losing money and in the process of that they're losing on potential return so it's always good just like what you said Kenny for for us to be able to diversify risk but one of them and this is not a legal advice I'm a CPA I'm not a financial planner but there is a buzz maybe it's something everybody has been hearing or a lot of people have been hearing there is a bond, is a government bond, and you know anything the federal government tax is a good one. It's called I bond. Uh, is a is an inflation bond, and right now it's paying as of now it's paying nine point six two percent. It's very very unheard of for bond to be paying that much. You know the reason it's paying that much is because of inflation. So because of inflation. Uh, right now, it's paying a lot. So a lot of people are doing it. And all, especially if you find yourself, uh, maybe it's very hard for you to invest. They make it easy for you. Once you go to Treasury Direct, you open an account, you can send them a check, you can do an ACH transfer. If that is too difficult for you to do, you can actually tell your tax preparer or once you prepare your taxes, some of the portion of your refund can actually go there. A lot of people do that, especially if you find it difficult. Remember what Kenny said, that you just have to start somewhere, even if it's just $10. So even if it's, maybe you get a refund, a lot of us, when we get a refund, we're just spending on anything. So that might be something you say, you know what? I am gonna make an effort to pull $2,000 away. 
I'm not going to even think about it. Just take it away. I don't want to see it. That one is called paper deposit. So when you do that, the uh, government will convert that money for you and they will put it in the I bond, for example. But you have to tell them where you want the money. So that is one that I will say. And another thing I, I want to talk about is uh, a lot of our big banks, they've really made investment very easy for us, uh, like Wells Fargo, Chase. And I can say of those two, probably Bank of America as well, that you can actually open a brokerage account with them. And you can periodically move money from those accounts into your investment account. So they're kind of making it easy. It may be a good thing to go with like uh, the bigger brokerage uh firms, but if that is difficult for you and you don't want to be logging into different things, then the next best thing is probably to go through your bank, especially if you use those big banks like Chase, like Wells Fargo. Again, I'm not promoting any of them. I'm just telling you that mm -hmm. they can make it easy for you to invest. And that way, once you log in, you can see your investment account as well as your uh, regular account. And you can do periodic investment. Maybe every time you get paid, you can tell them, move $100 from my uh, checking account to my investment account, and then you can invest. So those are the things I wanted to talk about. Wonderful. And then um, Felicia, I'll let you have the first crack at this one. But uh, another question was specifically about QuickBooks, um, okay. using that software to help track expenses, bills, et cetera. Just what are your general thoughts on QuickBooks? And Thank you. <laughs> QuickBooks is awesome. As a matter of fact, at CSU Global, in our undergraduate accounting class, we actually teach uh, QuickBooks because we know it's very important as accountants to know that. And even if you're not an accountant, that's another thing I love about uh, QuickBooks. Even you, Jerry, you can work on QuickBooks. So it's not just, <laughs> yeah, I'm taking a job at Jerry. Uh, so <laughs> he can use it. So that's how easy it is because all you need to do is just, you know, follow the instruction and there are a lot of instructions out there. However, the problem with QuickBooks and I'm not bad mouthing QuickBooks is very easy, but it can be pricey. As a matter of fact, uh, I always advise people to buy the desktop copy of, uh, of QuickBooks. However, as of 2021, they stopped selling desktop. They wanted to do QuickBooks online, which can be very pricey. Let me give you a, a price comparison. If you buy QuickBooks desktop, you can, they will usually support it for three to four years, like about three, four years. But if you do uh, QuickBooks online, for example, the, the amount of money you will use to subscribe for one year is the amount of money you can buy the desktop version, which you can use for three years. So as you can see, it's not really profitable for them. It's better for the consumer, but it's not really profitable for, for QuickBooks. So they moved away as of 2021, they moved away from desktop unless they change their mind. And now everybody has to do QuickBooks online. One of the pro is that it's very easy to do that. Anybody, even if you don't have any accounting background, you can use it. And just like the question asked, but I think it's Ashio, uh, you can actually track your expenses and revenue. And it doesn't have to be, even if you don't have a business, you can do it. But one thing I've been recommending to people as there are some alternatives to QuickBooks, especially for us, if we're on the project, we don't want to be spending all that money with QuickBooks. And especially also if we have a small business and we're not really big yet, then you might want to explore free option. I call it free option because they might not be as robust as QuickBooks, but I've seen people use it. And when they print the report, is as good as QuickBooks, I'm telling you. One of them is called WAVE, W-A-V-E. That's a good one that you can use and it's free. So you just need to register. And uh, once you register, it will tell you, it will show you how to enter those things. And um, at the end of the year, let's say you use an accountant, you can print your uh, profit and loss, your balance sheet, all those things and give them to your accountant. And trust me, your accountant will be very happy with you that they don't have to go through all your receipts, you just give them a report. So WAVE accounting is a very good option. I've been telling people, 
and nobody that I've recommended it to for like the last four years, they've never had any problem with it. But again, you are not paying for it, so it will not be as robust as QuickBooks. But for the people that use it, they actually like it. It's very easy to use. I hope I answer your question. Yeah. And then just to clarify, was that W-A-D as in dog? E? No, W-A-V-E, wave, wave as like in a, wave. Like a tidal wave, okay. <laughs> I wanted to make sure so that way anybody yeah, thank interested you. in- Thank in you for asking that. me to spell it out. Yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes, you know, you may not be able to understand, especially the alphabet we run into each other. It's W-A-V-E. <laughs> wave, yep. Wave okay. account. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, and, and, then, and I'll say this, there are other options, you know, online is your friend. I don't want to mention any search engine. If you go to any of the uh, popular search engine, just put uh, free or low cost. You can even put free accounting uh, software or something like that. There might be others that come up. But I'm telling you because I've used Wave myself uh, and I've recommended it to people. So that's why I'm telling you that. But there might be other options out there. Maybe newer one or better one, I don't know, but just, I mean, just search for it and you'll be able to find them. Wonderful, awesome. Thank you for that, Felicia. You're welcome. Um, and then Kenny, you know, just as you were talking about um, mutual, front, mutual funds, um, just brought up a, a question um, that I had possibly. So, you know, they always say that when you're younger to invest in kind of the more um, risky areas. So. Um, is that true? Would you, I mean, do you typically recommend that? So instead of doing something that's lower risk, um, do you recommend that as you're in your younger years that you should seek out higher risk um, opportunities because they typically pay higher dividends? Right. So as a general um, guideline, I would say that, but I will also um, preface that with everyone has their own risk tolerance and risk uh, profile. Um, so even some uh, investors in their young as in their youth more they might not have as high of a risk tolerance than others and kind of taking it back to the what we talked about with the budget you've got to make it yours so um, if risky for you if we're gonna like quantify it in terms of like you know where I'm at on the screen right here you know if this is what you're if up to my head here if that's your level of risk <laughs> that you're comfortable with then you know fine but if someone else might be down here you know toward my neck or shoulders whatever you're comfortable with in your earlier years as you have 20 30 years uh, away from retirement I, I definitely think that you can take on some higher levels of risk whatever that means within your range of risk tolerance and what you're comfortable with, then yes, I would say that is something that I would advise, yes. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, and then, and again, just posing it to everybody for all the attendees, if you do have any questions, make sure to use the chat or the QA feature down at the bottom. Um, but one more question, unless we have anything else come in, and this will be for both of you. So obviously, um, you know, this information is hugely important and I'm sure Part of what you all are discussing today could possibly be learned in uh, Kenny, either one of your finance classes and Felicia, one of your accounting classes. So for people that are not looking to either major in finance or accounting or get a specialization, is there one particular class that you think would just be so valuable to them to take as one of their general electives for any of our undergraduate students? Yeah, so I think um, we've got FIN 301, Principles of Finance for the Public Sector. That's a great one. Kind of covers, it's a very broad base, kind of like what we did tonight. It hits on a lot of different topics. And if there's a particular topic of interest uh, for you, um, chances are we've probably got an additional undergrad course that goes into that. Or if you want to, you know, have a specialization in something uh, or something along those lines. But that's that would be the one that I first gravitate to on my side. And I'll, I'll let Felicia talk a little bit more about the accounting side. Yeah, for the accounting side, I, I'm not, I'm in charge of the graduate accounting. So right. we have somebody else in your right. undergraduate. Right. But the good news is I know the program because we work so much together <laughs> that I know the undergraduate accounting program as well. Um, I believe she also has a, uh, an equivalent to the class you're talking about, but in the accounting side, I would have to say ACT, ACT 301. Uh, that one is a course that is for non-accounting majors. 
that they can take. And a lot of our students who have taken that, they like it, that some of them even now say, oh, maybe I can have a specialization in accounting. So that is a class that you can take to kind of get a taste of accounting. And uh, once you do, if you do like accounting, fine. If you don't, that's fine as well, because I always tell people that accounting is the language of business. So regardless of what you do, you need accounting in your life. So it will be a great class for you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's why I threw it out there. Because even if you're not a numbers person or you're not necessarily trying to do that for your job, uh, the information, I know can I take the FIN 500 class here as part of my degree. And Very nice. That was great. And then also had to do the accounting class at the graduate level for Felicia. So Oh, uh, they were yeah. they were a huge help for me. I know that. So excellent that a good question for everybody yeah. just in case they nice. wanted to explore these topics a little bit more. So, mm -hmm. um, but I don't see any other questions coming through. So I'm going to pose it one more time to the um, to the attendees. Um, if there's any questions, I'll give you just a quick second to jot that into either the chat or the QA. And if we don't see anything come through, then we will go ahead and wrap up for the evening, so. Excellent. While we're waiting on that, Jared, if anyone has anyone else, uh, any other questions, the next one that we're gonna do in a few months, just to kind of tease that a little bit, uh, we're gonna probably transition to cryptocurrencies and exploring that. I know there's a lot of questions around investing in, in cryptocurrencies. It's a big hot topic right now. So that's kind of where we're gonna go with this next time. So looking forward to uh, anyone that can join us for that and more more info to come on uh, scheduling for that. I'm sure you and I will work together on that, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, uh, I'm definitely interested in that because I, I still don't get it. I, <laughs> <laughs> not that I've taken a lot of time to look into it, but it's just one of those things that I'm just like, I don't get it. But yeah, um, I, so I'm definitely gonna look forward to that one. So I didn't get any other questions though. So, um, so at this point, we will just go ahead and um, wrap up our webinar. So thank you, everybody, for uh, taking your time out and joining Kenny and Felicia on this awesome topic. And thank you both uh, for sharing your knowledge and your expertise in relation to um, taxes and budgeting and finance. And we look forward to the upcoming one on crypto. So, all right. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.